chorus one more time. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high.
your love. Your love is devoted like a ring of solid gold, like a vial that is tested, like a common antidote.
there are plenty of reasons to praise you this morning. Thank you, God. Continue to move. Continue to show us your power as we press into your goodness, Lord. You give us plenty of reasons to praise you all over again. Even in the darkest night, we can look back and we can see what you've done, what you're doing, what you will do, all of your promises, God. You give us plenty of reasons to praise you. So many. <laughs> you give us plenty of reasons, God. Plenty of reasons to praise you. Give us plenty of reasons to praise you. Just take a moment. Think of all he's done throughout your entire life. Just give him praise this morning. Oh, you've given us plenty of reasons to praise you all over again. Give us plenty of reasons to praise you. Plenty of reasons to praise you. Plenty of reasons to praise you all over again. You give us plenty of reasons to praise you. Inhabit the praises of your people, Jesus. surrounding me let it break at your name still call the sea to still the rage in me to still every way at your name Jesus Jesus you make the darkness tremble
sing the name of Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. In the darkness. Jesus, Jesus. You silence fear. Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus. Right here, out of your own mouth, with your own song, just lift up the name of Jesus in this place. Come on, lift up the name of Jesus. We lift our Savior high this morning. Fear has to bow. Fear has to scatter at the name of Jesus. Anxiety has to go at the name of Jesus. Depression has to leave at the name of Jesus. Come on, lift up the name of Jesus. Right here. There's power in his name.
Father, we come to you right now, and we believe that to be true. We believe that there is power in your son Jesus' name, Lord. We believe that 
to be true. Some of us walked in here today, and maybe we weren't sure where we stood when we were walking in, but we do believe that to be true, Father, that there is power in your son's name, in the name of Jesus. The chains can be broken, Lord. Lord, there are, there are people in this room today, Lord, that need their chains broken. They've tried on their own. It has not worked, and they ended up here today. They need to know that there is power in your name. The chains can be broken, Lord. The chains of depression, the chains of addiction, the chains of loneliness. Lord, freedom is available through your son, and we thank you for that, Father. We thank you for, for being present, for meeting us here this morning, today, Lord. You are with us. You are for us. You are not against us. You want the best for us. You want life to the full for each one of us in this room. And so in this moment, we just stop and we say, we surrender to ourselves, our way of thinking, our way of living, and we give it to you. We believe in your son, Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you guys for leading us. Can we give it up for the Lord and all that he is doing in this room, in our church, that there is power in the name of Jesus? It's beautiful. Hey, before you grab a seat, some of you already have, if you could, please find somebody around you. And would you just say, welcome to church this morning. Give them a high five. Say, it's a great day to be at church. Well, welcome to Church of the City. My name is Derek, and I have a privilege of serving as one of the pastors here at Church of the City Spring Hill. We're, we're glad all of you are here today. Maybe, maybe you're a guest with us today, though, and I want to make sure you know this. This is a church. This is a place where you can belong. No matter what you walk in that door with, this is a place where you can belong. You can be a part of what God is doing here. Uh, one simple way for you to get connected and just hear more about what's going on at Church of the City uh, Inside the, the back pocket of the seat in front of you, there's a card that says share with us on it. We would love to have you fill that out. And now our worship pastor and myself, we're going to be hanging out at the Next Steps booth in the lobby after service. Fill that out and, and hand that off to us. We'd love to meet you, give you a high five, say hey, and give you a free gift just for being here. On the other side of that card, just so you know as well, it is a, a prayer request card. And we would love to pray for you. If you have something, you have a need, we want to join with you in prayer for God to move. Maybe it is a chain to be broken. Maybe it's something you want a prayer team to be aware of. We want to pray with you in that. So fill that out, and you can drop that off uh, with us as well. And we will have prayer available at the end of service as well. If you have a need, you want to pray with someone. Well, at this time, I'd like to invite the worship hosts to come forward as they prepare to receive the offering. And uh, one thing I want to let you know about with this time, we're in this series right now called The Way of Jesus. And we're talking about the difference between what the world values, the right side up kingdom, and, and what God values, the, the upside down kingdom. As we've been studying the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon ever told by Jesus, Matthew chapter 5 through 7, we, we see there's an upside down kingdom. And this moment right now is a chance for you to engage in the upside down kingdom. You see, because in the world, it does not make sense to just give our money away. That does not make sense in the right-side-up kingdom. But in the upside-down kingdom, it makes complete sense. Why? Because Jesus gave himself for us. And so this is a chance for us to engage in the upside-down kingdom, not only for our lives and in our hearts, but to see the kingdom of God move forward. And we celebrate how the Lord is moving his kingdom to this earth. Recently, I had the opportunity to, to see how this is taking place. Uh, many of you know we have a ministry called City Students. It's for 6 through 12. Yeah, we got some fans, big fans. Every Wednesday night, they gather in this building, 6th through 12th graders. It's an amazing ministry. Well, last Wednesday, they had the chance to gather with all of our family of churches, all of the city students from around Middle Tennessee, Church of the City, and they gathered for a night of worship. And it was just one of those beautiful nights where it was like the upside down kingdom taking place where students on a school night are gathering together and just worshiping Jesus at the top of their lungs. I want, I want you to see a glimpse of what took place 
last Wednesday night. Check this out. I want city students to be known for being inclusive of all people. I would want city students to be known as the church that you know that you're welcome here. I want city students to be known for being a group of people who have an insatiable desire to be in the presence of God. I want city students to be known for our great community. I want city students to be known as a safe place for anyone and everyone to come. I want city students to be known for the way that we love one another. I want city students to be known for connecting everyone. I want city students to be known for a place where they can trust people. I want city students to be known for having new people come in and feel loved. Isn't that great? I watched that video and, and um, you know, it makes me realize I'm not concerned about the future of the church. When I see 700 plus students on a Wednesday night worship Jesus at the top of their lungs, it's an exciting ministry. And side note, parents, if you have kids, it's 6th through 12th grade, they meet every Wednesday night right here, 6.30. We'd love to have you be a part of that. But thank you for your generosity, which allows ministries like that to exist, the kingdom of God breaking through, not only into the, the ministry, but into our schools, and through those students, into their classmates, into their teachers. It's an amazing thing. Let's, uh, let's thank the Lord for how he's working and ask for him to bless this offering. Father, we thank you for how you're moving. We thank you for the, the students' lives that are being impacted by Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus. We thank you for the stories, the miracles taking place through city students, and we believe it's just the beginning, Lord. We believe there's so much more to come, and Lord, we pray even as we give back to you that your kingdom would break through into our hearts as we give generously, that your kingdom would break through through all the ministries, not just here in Spring Hill, but beyond, Lord. Your kingdom would come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we trust you in this area of our life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, as the worship host received the offering, a few things for you to be aware of going on in the life of our church. First of all, um, we have a lot going on in the next few weeks. And so instead of telling you everything that's going on, what I want to encourage you to do is we, I've talked about this for the past few weeks. We have a brand, we have an app called Church of the City that you can download. And all you have to do is, you know, go to your application, search for Church of the City app, and you can download this app. Uh, and we'd love to have you stay connected through all things Church of the City related through that. If you go to it, very important for you to click on the Spring Hill tab, and then you'll see this week in Spring Hill. And you'll actually see for the next few weeks what's coming up in the life of our church. You'll see that this week, this Wednesday, we have a little thing called Toddle Rock for parents of toddlers. If you're looking for a little place for the kids to get the wiggles out, you know, and for you to get some free coffee, that's a great thing for you to do this Wednesday at 10 a.m. You'll see another thing on there. It's a ministry called Moms Connect. It's a chance for moms of all ages, young or older, uh, to gather together and just hang out together and study together, study the scriptures and have Jesus meet them there. So that's this Thursday at 9.30, I believe. And I think there's like 63 moms signed up for that. I, I believe most of them are filling soon. So if you want to be a part of that, sign up today. You'll also see we have a little thing called Financial Peace University coming up. And uh, if you've never taken this, I highly encourage you to, to be a part of this. It might be the most spiritual thing you do this year by figuring out how to honor the Lord in that area. Uh, of your life. So I encourage you to download the app. If you don't have a smartphone, you still have the, you know, the Moto Razor, whatever you have. Uh, if you still have that, it's fine. Totally cool. We don't, in fact, I, that's pretty awesome. Like you're going old school. Old school is, is in, you know. Um, you can go to the website, churchofthecity.com slash springhill to get the info. All right. Last thing to share with you. Uh, I'm really excited because this time next Sunday, we're going to be a part of something pretty special. Do you guys know what's happening next Sunday? What is it? Vision Sunday. How many of you guys went last year? Just want to see a show of hands on that. Awesome. Okay, I hope all of you get to experience this. If you didn't go last year, I want to give you a glimpse of what took place. Check this out. You made a way when there was no way. And I believe I'll see you do it again. I see you move. You move the mountains. And I believe. Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. 
Renew them in our day. In our time, make them known. Our Nashville churches gather together to celebrate what God has done and to ask Him to do it again. Doesn't that look like fun? You guys excited? I hope you are. Um, I hope that you guys are able to make it. it you sh should have received a handout as you walked in. Inside there, it should give you all the information on how to be a part of this thing. We have free parking for you. It's at Nissan Stadium, and you'll get shuttled over. We'll have a great time. Starts at 10 a.m. I encourage you to get there early. And, and here's the beautiful thing, you guys. There's no traffic on I-65 North on Sunday morning. So you could probably leave at 920 and still make it there, which is awesome. You know what I'm saying? You don't have to use the Waze app or anything. Um, so anyways, we'd love to have you there. Get there early. There's some food that will be available. Some child care is available still, I believe. You can sign up to use that. And then I'd encourage you to go with your friends or your missional community and hang out, grab a meal afterwards downtown. Just be a fun day. You're going to hear stories of how God has moved this past year. You're going to hear some powerful stories, even from right here in Spring Hill, of how God's moved, how miracles have taken place. And then we're going to ask for the Lord to do it again. We're going to look ahead to this next year together as a family of churches and ask for the Lord to move powerfully uh, through this place. So I'm really excited. I hope you can make it there. And don't show up here because there will be absolutely nothing happening here at 9 or 11. And you can't say, oh, well, go get Chick-fil-A afterwards. Chick-fil-A is closed on Sundays. Come on, guys. You know, remember that. Okay? So, all right. Well, I'm excited today because we are continuing our series, The Way of Jesus. We have a guest with us today who I just absolutely love this place is his home. Uh, Mr. Danny Williamson is here to teach with us today, and we're excited because you have sweet hair, and you're going to give everybody a high five in the room at some point. We're excited to have you, Danny. Uh, before Danny gets up here to share, um, I'm going to ask Pam to come to the stage, and she's going to read the scripture for this morning. So would you please stand in the honor of the reading of God's word? Good morning. It's so good to be in the house of the Lord, right? Amen. Okay. We are reading Matthew 5, 17 through 20. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks the the, one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Let's welcome Danny. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good. All right. Good, good, good. We join me in a word of prayer. Jesus, thank you so much for your presence in this place. I thank you for the power of your name. God, I pray that we would hear from your word this morning, that you would take me out of the way. God, we come to you with open hands, with open hearts. And we ask you to bless this time in your scriptures. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So I met a nun on the airplane, and it changed my life. I was on an international trip to Uganda, and the first leg of the journey was from Nashville to Boston, about two and a half hours. And as I get into the plane, I, I get my seat and getting ready to put on my noise-canceling earphones. I look behind me, and there's a, there's a group of nuns on the airplane, all dressed in their habit and all of those things. And um, as I'm sitting there, you know, before I put on those earphones, getting ready to lock in and have my book and get in my little airplane zone, um, this couple walks in with a baby, and they're holding the baby. And, and then instead of asking me to change seats, they ask the nun behind me, excuse me, will you, will you change seats with us so that we can sit together? And the nun said, sure, okay. And she comes and sits next to me. 
And when she did, true story, she looks over and she says, how bad would that have looked if I said no? <laughs> I was like, this lady's incredible. So I just, I put down my noise canceling earphone, was like, I gotta know a little bit more about your story. So I just started barraging her with questions because who ever gets to sit next to a nun? For a couple of hours. So I just started asking her questions and hearing her story, how she did her vow, like all that goes into being a nun. And, and then I asked her, you know, what's your name? And her name happened to be Beatrice. If you don't know this, the name Beatrice means giver of joy. And for those who know me, joy is a big deal in my life. I love joy. So I'm like, I can't believe I'm sitting next to the joy giver right now. And so we start talking and talking. And not only did she exude this joy and this amazing love for Jesus, since he was her husband, she loved Jesus so much and she exuded this joy, but she also had something that got me cu curious and it also got me, and it also challenged my heart is she was very, very satisfied because she lived to give and she was satisfied. She lived in this small little convent in, the, in a village in Ireland just serving the people and, and, and living with her sisters and, and she was satisfied. And I was so challenged by this for a number of reasons. One, I became really glad that I'm not called to be a monk. Two, I realize that it's actually possible to live with a satisfied heart. And three, there is true satisfaction with Jesus, and there is no satisfaction without him. Now, various life experiences I've had, I've had some moments of real satisfaction. For example, Claim Jumper. Have you guys been to Claim Jumper? I mean, they have some monster portions. And I remember years ago, I was about 19 at the time, and my parents took me out to Claim Jumper, and like, get whatever you want, Danny. I'm like, okay, all you can eat salad bar, big mother load dish. I got the carrot cake the size of my dad's face. I mean, it was just a huge portions, and I'm eating, and I walked out of there so full. When, I, when, when we got into the car, sitting in the back, and I started to doze off, you know, the sleepy dozes, and, and I'm starting to doze off, and I wake up, and... <laughs> I was gasping for air because I realized I was so full, I was, it was possible that I was going to stop breathing in my sleep. So I was scared to fall asleep. And I was really satisfied from food at that time. Or the satisfaction that comes through going on vacation, like Destin, Florida, where you put your toes in the white sand and the waves splash and the kids are splashing around and you're just on vacation, you're away from the worries of what's going on in Nashville. There you are just enjoying it to the fullest. Or when we lived down in Costa Rica for five months, we were there to serve the Lord, but we also were surfing. So we were serving and surfing. It was really great. Now, I used to tell my wife, hey, we're going out to, the, we're going to be surfing. There's some surfers out there who need to hear the gospel. And she's like, right. <laughs> so we were surfing about five times a week, having a great time. And, and just, I mean, the water was warm. There were barrels. It was just perfect surf. It's incredible, but you know what I realized in this time, and in the midst of all this fun and excitement and those moments of satisfaction, is that in and of themselves, they do not satisfy. Amen. You see, because I get hungry again. A few hours after that claim jumper experience, I'm like, hmm, what's in the fridge? I want to, you know what, with Destin, as wonderful it is, as we're thinking there, we need to do this every year. We want to go back again. Now, surfing in Tennessee little minimal, okay? Can't really do it. So that's limited. So it, it's one of those things that I've begun to realize that I really can't get no satisfaction without Jesus. Amen. There's no satisfaction without Jesus. So here now in his Sermon on the Mount, he will be inviting us again and again to his call of perfection, the depth of his holiness, the wonder of his purity, because the way of Jesus is perfection, not just outwardly, but inwardly. And we will see on our own, his standard is absolutely impossible. But thankfully, that isn't the end of the story. As we saw in the beginning of this whole series, as, as Derek quoted John 15, that Jesus said, for without me, you can do nothing. 
Only Jesus can satisfy our souls. Only he can fulfill our need. Only he can complete our story. Like what F.F. Bruce said, the soul's deepest thirst is for God himself who made us so that we can never be satisfied without him. So let's look now at this text here in this first point that Jesus satisfies the law and the prophets. Let's read it again in verse 17 and 18. Jesus says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. So first things first, Jesus is, is showing, look, I am in full support of the scriptures. I'm in full support of the law and the prophets because there were some in his day, many in that day, were, that were doubting that he did. They were saying, oh, you're a heretic. You're not teaching the law and the prophets. And he says, no, 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 no. On the contrary, I am not abolishing them in any way. I'm coming really to support them and to ultimately fulfill them. So let's get an understanding even deeper now of what he's speaking of, the law and the prophets. What is that? Really, it's the Old Testament. It's the Old Testament. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And he's speaking of both the Old and the New Testament. All of scripture is profitable for us. All that we hold in our hands or in our phone it is profitable. But if you're like me, sometimes the Old Testament can be a bit challenging to understand. When you think of all the laws and you're reading through Leviticus and you're reading through Exodus and you're like, what? All these moral laws, these ceremonial laws, these sacrificial laws, these architectural laws, all these laws and you're like, what is going on here, God? What is this all about? Or the prophecy that you see, minor prophets, major prophets, you have messianic prophecies, end times prophecies, all these things. Or you look at the history of the Old Testament that's accounted for, family lines of kings and priests, nation of, the nation of Israel's history, miracles, testimony of God's faithfulness. Then you have all the poetry, and you have psalms and songs within the psalms, and you have Proverbs, and you have Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. You're like, wow, there's a lot going on in here. What's it all for? So if we were to sum up the entirety of the Old Testament, if we were to sum it all up, it reveals two things. The first is the truth of our human condition. You, be, you, you read through the Old Testament and you see like, you know what, we really are all jacked up. Our mankind, like as mankind, we are messed in the head. Like we're, there's something wrong with us. And we qu come quick to realize we have all fallen short of the glory of God. You see it and you're like, oh wow, Israel, the na as a nation, you really messed up. Then you compare it to your own life, like, man, I really messed up. And we realize we've really have, our human condition is fallen, but it also shows the grace of a humble father who went to all costs to rescue us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. John 1.14 sums it up quite well when it, speaks, when it says the word, speaking of Jesus, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and the only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. The truth exposes our sinful state, but grace redeems us from that sinful state. Jesus came in grace and in truth. And ultimately, Jesus has come to complete the overall theme of all of Scripture and, re and satisfy every requirement, every prophecy, every historical account, every aspect of redemption is found in the person of Jesus Christ. So now let's unpack this even more as we look at the law and we see what he's talking about here. First of all, the goodness of the law, that the law really is good. Now, we had a chance to live in Israel for about five months back in 2005. And while we lived in Israel, lived in Tel Aviv, we used to go down to Jerusalem once a week. And as we go down to Jerusalem, they're at the Western Wall. And you see all the Orthodox Jews. They're, they're rocking. They're praying. And they took the law very, very serious. 
they, they, was, it was strict and it was precise to how they curled their hairs, how they, how they, what they're wearing, like all these. They took it very serious and it was honorable, but it was also a little bit burdensome to even watch. And I remember being down at the Western Wall and it was at, at, at the end of, of one of the holidays, it was the Jewish New Year and, and the Day of Atonement that they're celebrating and remembering and all the, all the rabbis and everybody down at the, at the Western Wall, they're all dressed in white. And they had little white kippahs, and, and, and they're just all there waiting for the, the, the horn to blast for the new year. And they had the time precisely set when that was to be. But they weren't the only group of Orthodox Jews there. There was also a group that were a little more hippie. They would wear like the old school, 2,000-year-old fashion garbs, and they're, they're wearing their robes, and they got just this long wavy hair. And they're, but they're, they're trying to follow the law as well. So one of them had a big, big shofar, okay? And there's hundreds of people there at the Western Wall. We're witnessing all this. It was amazing. And this other group, and this one guy gets his shofar, and he's like, boom, and he just blasts it, da, 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 you know, this huge horn blast. And then all of a sudden, all these other Orthodox guys run over, and they're like, what have you done? It's too early. It's not in the law. What's going on? And, what, and the guy, the more hippie guy, was like, Shana Tova, Shana Tova, which means Happy New Year. And so it was this huge moment. I was like, these guys are taking the law really serious. It was incredible. But of the 613 Old Testament laws that these guys are trying to keep, whether it's food laws, kosher law. Now, I'm really gra- glad for the season of grace because I love bacon. It's amazing and so anointed. <laughs> but then there's another thing that's, even though I ate it a couple of days ago, it's, it's actually kind of gross, is shellfish. It's a bug. Like if you look at a crab and then you stick it next to a spider, pretty similar. Just saying. So thank you, Jesus, for that. And another thing about kosher, if you're ever booking somebody's international travel and you're going on a trip with somebody and you're like, hey, I'll get your ticket. We'll work it all out. I'll do all. So um, I just dare you to order them a kosher meal. It's pretty cool. Did that to one of my buddies. He, I, I was meeting him. I'm flying from California to London. And I booked it. I was like, I got your ticket, bro. Kosher. <laughs> and he shows up in London like, really, bro? Good times. So be careful when you travel with me. <laughs> clothing. And then there's these clothing laws, like how they wear and, and not mixing wool with cotton and all these different laws that they're trying to keep. Now, you look at the Orthodox Jew, and ultimately, you guys, they are unfulfilled, still looking, still searching, still waiting for Messiah, still trying ultimately to earn God's blessing, still trying to fulfill the law. But nonetheless, the law is still good. We're not to reject it or abolish it. But why is the law good? If it has all these things involved, all these 613 laws, why is it good? Listen to what Galatians 3, 23 through 25 says. Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came, that we might be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. The law is our tutor. The law is our guardian to bring us to Jesus. Because when we look at the law and we see, this is overwhelming, I cannot possibly keep it. Ah, we drop to our knees and say, God, I need you. I need your help. So it ultimately is to bring us to Jesus, as it does with the Messianic Jew. The one who has found the beauty of this truth, the Messianic Jew, believing in Jesus as Messiah. You see, they are fulfilled. They are satisfied in Yeshua. The search is over. The prophecies are fulfilled. The historical promises are answered. You see, because they've come to the end of themselves, and they realize that in the sum of the book, it's all pointing to Jesus. Jesus satisfies the law. Jesus satisfies its demands. Which leads me to ask, are we satisfied? Are we satisfied? Or are we still trying to impress God? 
thinking if, if we do this or if we don't do this, he's gonna love us more. Did you know that you're God's favorite? Do you know that, John? You're God's favorite. And maybe you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. God doesn't play favorites, Danny. Tell me one person that he loves more than you. One person he loves more than you. You're God's favorite. Celebrate it. Because so often we can get in this mindset of doing, of doing, oh, I just want to do this, and I want to please you, and I want to, I want to do this for you. And, and God's saying, it's done. To tell us die, it is finished. As he went to the cross and he says, it is done. You do not have to earn my favor. I already love you. I already love you. Amen. To tell us die, it is finished. You see, the sacrificial system has been trumped by the power of his blood and his sacrifice. Hebrews 9 verses 12 through 15 says this. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place. Once and for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciousness from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God, for this reason Christ is a mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised in eternal inheritance, now that he has died as a ransom, to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. So we see that the law is good, and Jesus fulfills every bit of it. And then he also reveals the awesomeness of Scripture, as, as not even the smallest letter or stroke of pen will fade from his word. Psalms 119.89 says, Your word, Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. His word is awesome. His word lasts forever. It is impossible to fade or decay. Now, have any of you ever had a piece of clothing that you just love? That you just love? Well, I have one of those pieces of clothing that is both, I would say, distracting and irresistible. <laughs> oh, yeah. Now, I bought this shirt at a thrift store, so it was already about 20 years old. This bad boy right here. And in 2002, I was rocking this, all right? I was rocking. I, I wore it to church. I was living in Colorado Springs. And uh, this was the next, next best thing since sliced bread. I was like, man, I'm going to rock this shirt. There I am, and I'm wearing this shirt. And uh, as I have my hands raised, yes, Jesus, yes, Lord. And like tears are probably flowing because I'm a crier, and I just love the presence of the Jesus. And I'm like, yeah, I'm in worship in the back of the church. And this guy walks up to me. Remember, middle worship. Walks up and he says, bro, bro, bro. And I'm like, yes. And he's like, sweet shirt. <laughs> 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 So distracting. But it's also irresistible. Because about a year later, this bad boy right here was being worn by me in church. And uh, we happened to be saving a seat by a young lady I had yet to meet named Michelle Torres. Oh, yes. And 14 years later of marriage, I'm thankful for that shirt right there. Because it was irresistible. <laughs> Unforgettable. And you know what, I even hope to pass this shirt on to my kids someday and like, hey, you'll probably meet your wife wearing this one. <laughs> so I'm trying to keep it around as long as I can. But one day it's going to fade. But the word of God will never fade. It is eternal. It is set in the heavens. So we can conclude with Jesus that his word is good and his word is awesome. Now, a second major point here that is the fact that Jesus satisfies our need for love. Verse 19 says, Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will, will be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So let's summarize really what he's, what he's saying here about the commandments, about the commands. And if you remember... All the commands are summed up in this. Love God and love people, as Jesus said. 
the, the entirety of the commandments are summed up in these two things, that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and that you love your neighbor as yourself. So if we want to bring it all together, we would say these commandments are summed up in this, love God and love people. Loving God with all of our heart, our mind, our soul, our strength. Why do we love him? Because he first loved us. Every single motivation of God is founded with love. Every aspect of his creation, every move of his spirit, every facet of his word, everything about God is founded with love. He's a loving father. And he simply has his arms stretched wide. And he's saying, all who desire me, I am here. I'm waiting and I want to lavish you with my love. For example, yesterday with Josiah, my my three-year-old is about to turn four. He's just a precious boy. And, and yesterday, he, he was kind of like this day with, he just wanted to be around dad. He, he was like, hey, will you carry me? Okay, I'll carry you. Will you read to me? It was like a 500-page page, page book. Okay, buddy. Whew, not more. Okay. You know, on the rocking chair. Oh, this is a big one. Yeah, buddy. You know, reading it to him. Had to have one, one of my other boys, like, help me out. He's like, this is how you do it, dad. You know, <laughs> So he just wanted to be around me to the point even usually he wants his mom to put him down. But he was like, can daddy put me down tonight? And then I get in there. He's like, will you sing me a song? And will you sing me a funny song? And then a worship song? And like, I was like, man, is, he wants to be around me. I was so blessed. You know what? So too with the Lord. Call upon him. He's waiting. Amen. He's waiting for us to say, daddy, will you carry me? Daddy, will you, will you read to me? Daddy, will you, will you sing me a song? Let's reach out to him. He's waiting. And as we do, we're, we begin loving him with our heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength. Loving God isn't this complicated thing. It's just hanging out with our Father. And now the second part, which is a bit more challenging, but it's not complicated. We're not going to get complicated on this one. Loving people. And the, the truth is, the more we're abiding in that first commandment of loving God and abiding in God the easier it is to love people. I love what Bob Goss said. He says, while you're figuring out what God wants you to do next, go love everybody. It's true. We're like, oh, what do you want to do, God? He's like, how about you like, say hi to somebody or give them a high five? I love high fives. I believe it's the international sign of friendliness. And, and I was in Disney World the other day. We were on a business trip. It was the last day of our business trip, and we had, it was a good time, but one of my buddies, as we're walking, he's like, I dare you to give everybody you see a high five. I'm like, don't tempt me, bro. <laughs> he's like, no, do it, man. So I was like, okay, fine. So, so I just started, everybody, everybody see, high five, man, high five, boom. You know what? 50 for 50, 100%. Everybody gave me a high five. <laughs> Woo! It was incredible. You know what I'm saying? Like, nobody denied the high five. It's this friendly thing. Like, sure, I'll give you a high five, man. Yeah, yeah I might use some Purell after. But it's cool. <laughs> let's give a high five. You know, it's, it's, but let's just love people. When we're wondering, what do I do next? Give someone a high five. Say hi. Tell them they're awesome. 1 John 4, 8, God is love. Everything he's about is love. So let's love God and let's love people. And as we do, we become satisfied with our need for love. And this leads us to this last truth that Jesus satisfies our life with his righteousness. Verse 20, it says, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. The secret sauce to this theme of satisfaction and fulfillment is this. There is no satisfaction without surrender. Satisfaction can only come through surrender. So here is the problem then with the, the lives of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law that Jesus is mentioning here. They strived for righteous living. They really did, like I saw in Israel. They were consumed by keeping the law, but they attempted to fulfill it and do it in their own strength. They were seeking to impress God through outward religion and keeping the law. But God isn't looking for your outward religion. He's looking for your heart. 
Jesus goes beyond the written letter. As we're going to see in the Sermon on the Mount, he goes beyond the written letter and he goes right to the heart. He cuts to the heart, cutting between soul and spirit, bone and marrow. And it, and it pricks our heart with conviction. You see, he's looking for righteousness in the innermost part of our being. He's not interested in just putting a band-aid over our sin problem. He's looking to transform us from the inside out. The thing is, if we insist, like Frank Sinatra would sing, I did it my way, we missed the boat. And we just stuck a band-aid on our sin problem. Jesus wants to get to the deep down place of our heart. You see, doing it our way doesn't lead to satisfaction. It doesn't lead to redemption, justification, or sanctification either. Satisfaction can only come through surrender. Surrender of our will. Surrender of our pride. And we're going to have the elements being passed out right now. And this, the, even the act of taking communion is an act of surrender, of just saying, God, I cannot save myself. I look to you. I look to your cross. I look to your blood that was spilled, your body that was broken, and I sit at your table because I cannot save myself. Now, in the early days of learning how to surf, I, I remember being out, and, and I was probably 18 at the time, and, and there I was in San Diego. And as I'm learning how to surf, I was on this little spongy board, and and I didn't know why I was the only one out there, but I was, I, I, little to my knowledge, I had been dr being drifted out to sea. And I thought I was having a good time on these waves and like, yeah, all right. But I was drifting out to sea and I didn't even know it. And then this young 14-year-old lifeguard comes swimming up to me with his little Baywatch paddle and he's, and he's like, you need to come in with me, sir. I'm like, why, I'm having a great time. And as, I, as I'm being taken out to sea, he's like, no, you really need to come in with me because you're going to die. It's like, okay, man. Okay, so he just had his little flippers and swam me to the shore. Here's what I realized with this. I say we just roll with the rescue. We're, we're, we're being, in our own way, we're starting to do it our way, and we're just being carried out to sea. And the Lord comes out in his humble form, and he says, look, I can, I can bring you to shore. You're headed for death. Okay, I'm going to roll with the rescue. I'm going to let you take me in, Lord. Romans 6, 22 through 23 says, But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And we rejoice with the song that contrasts greatly with that of Sinatra's claim, as Phil Wickham recently wrote. I searched through the earth for something that could satisfy, a peace for the hurt I had buried deep inside. Knees on the floor, I finally found everything I needed. You lifted my soul and opened up my eyes, and I never knew anything last forever till I found you, till I found you. You, amen, is right. Surrender to Jesus equals a satisfied life. Where you raise the white flag and say, all right, Lord, all right. Surrendering to his righteousness equals a righteous life. You see, for when we're satisfied in him, Sin begins to lose its flair and lose its power, and he begins to live through us, empowering us to live with soul righteousness, not stiff-necked religiousness. So as, we're, as we continue on over the next few weeks of looking at this Sermon on the Mount and all the struggles that come up with our flesh, the, the challenge of, of anger, which leads to murder, and then, and then adultery and, and attitudes and all of these things that come up, and Jesus is pointing them to, and he's calling them out in our heart, and he's saying, look, if you begin with just being satisfied in me, they won't even have an appeal because you realize that I am enough. So as we come to the table now, we look at his bread and his cup. As his body was broken for us, his blood was shed so that we could live. Let's partake of this together. So I want to pray and ask that Jesus, you would bless 
this bread. Thank you for your body that was broken for us. Lord, you went to that cross, despised the shame so that we could live. Thank you for your body, Lord. You're the bread of life. We find our life in you. Let's partake of the bread together. And then he took the cup. Thank you, Jesus, for your cup. Your blood that was shed so that we could take on your righteousness and live forever with you. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood, the power of your blood that cleanses us from all sin. Let's partake of the cup together. So thankful for the grace of God. If we could all stand together. As we're doing so, there's going to be people up front that are ready to pray with you. If you just need some prayer, you need some encouragement, you, maybe you're carrying those heavy loads or the, those chains, and you're just ready for them to go. Get some prayer. There's people up here ready to pray with you. But I want to share with you, really, in a sense, a poetic benediction that you can go out in today. Those of you who know me know I love poetry. So let's receive this here. Break. Breaking free, released to be, delivered from captivity that once held hostage liberty meant for me. Fresh water flowing, but I keep withholding my heart from you, withholding my dreams from you. Maybe the sorrow is too great. Shame holds my fate, holding heavy weights of pride and isolation, fear and trepidation, masked with false expectations, hidden shames. Who is to blame? Is it me or the name of the one, two, or three who inflicted wounds to hurt me? Release these. Burdens block the stream, it seems, but everlasting water brings life to the dying, freedom from lying, multiplying wonders of grace-covered blunders, making beauty from vulnerability, providing tranquility to the exhausted builder of these dams. Break the sorrow, break the silence, heal my tomorrow. I surrender in reverence to your presence of deliverance from this dam of unknown ignorance because freedom sings the song of surrendered melodies. Breaking the dam, voice of the lamb, calling out to the son of Adam, this man I am, your river, your delight. I am your song in the night. I am your water, your life. I respond, break the broken places that bind me. Jesus, thank you so much for your sons and your daughters in this room today. Satisfy them, Lord, with your presence. Satisfy them with your living water. Fill us to the point of overflowing, Lord Jesus, that we can bring your love to the ends of the earth and throughout this community. Thank you, Jesus. We give you glory in your precious name. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great, great Sunday.